National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations bring you Chapter 13 of The Eternal Light. This public service program is prepared under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Our story today, adapted by Morton Wishingrad from the Book of Esther, features Joan Alexander as Esther and Alexander Scorby as narrator. Following the dramatic portion of the program, you will hear a talk by Dr. Israel Goldstein. Esther, Esther, bring the wine to the table. The wine is already here. <laughs> Today, Esther, you may bring more wine. We're an abstinent people, but all things in their place. More wine, Esther. Very well. I'll bring it. <laughs> Don't have such a long face. We shall not drink much. Only enough so that we can no longer distinguish between cursed be Haman and blessed be Mordecai. <laughs> Come, my friends, it's a day of festival. Sing. Let's all sing. There's such gladness in the sound of music. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The voices are like the precious ointment upon the head. Oh, Esther, my people, who can destroy him who has never forgotten to sing? The sorrow of the present is brief in moments, and honey tastes sweeter in the mouth after the bitterness of Mara. And if there has been much bitterness, surely there will be sweetness also, and kindness and love. Therefore, let me borrow from the past and make this a season of festival. I shall tell you a story of another Esther, a story of Esther the Queen, and pray may you find it good. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, king over Persia and Media, that he made a feast unto his princes and his servants, and his heart was merry with wine. And Ahasuerus gave command to his seven chamberlains to bring Queen Vashti to show her beauty, for she was fair to look on. And Vashti the queen refused to come, and the anger of Ahasuerus burned within him. Chamberlains, the queen does me great wrong. Yes, your majesty, but we are also wrong. Hmm? How so, chamberlain? If the queen may disobey the king, all women may disobey their husbands. Hmm. And what is your advice, Chamberlain? If it please your majesty, let a royal commandment be promulgated. Yes? That it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that Vashti is put down as queen, and that her royal estate be given unto one who is better than she. Chamberlain, that's a good plan. But I need a new queen. Yes, of course. What do you suggest? A competition, your majesty. Competition. Let all the young maidens be gathered and brought to Shushan, and the maiden who pleases you most will be my queen. A very good plan, Chamberlain. See to it at once. (laughs) 
The thing pleased the king, and it was done. Now, there was a certain Jew in Shushan whose name was Mordecai, a descendant of those carried away captive from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is, Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maiden was fair to look on. Mordecai, they call me to the palace of the king. And why not, Esther? Thine eyes are as the pools of Heshbon by the gate of Bathrabin. I do not wish to go among the heathen. She who is called must go, Esther. No, Mordecai. Do not fear. The king shall look upon my Esther and say, There are threescore queens and fourscore concubines, and maidens without number. But this one is the only one of her mother. Yea, she is as fair as the moon, clear as the sun. Very well. I shall go, Mordecai. May God be with you. But I charge you one thing. Do not reveal your people, Esther. Do not tell them you are a Jew. So it came to pass that many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan. And Esther also was brought unto the king's house. And what is your name? They call me Esther. Esther, it has a soft sound on the tongue. The pomegranates are in flower, but they are pale beside your lips. Esther, you are the fairest among women. It is not so, sire. Esther, I say it is so, therefore it must be so. Go into the house of the women, and let them anoint you with myrrh and frankincense, and say to them, that Ahasuerus has found a queen. Now Esther had not showed her kindred nor her people according to the commandment of Mordecai, and she found grace and favor in the sight of the king. And Mordecai found it good, and came daily and sat before the gate of the palace of the king. Then one day, when he sat in the king's gate, there came two of the king's chamberlains, and they did not see Mordecai, and they whispered, You feel as I do? Yes. I hate Ahasuerus. He holds the scepter, but we are as good as he is. Better, perhaps. Then why do we wait? Do we have a debt to Ahasuerus? I have searched in my heart, but I know no debt. Then let us lay hands on him. Kill him? Why not? A king is only mortal. Yes. Yes. We shall kill Ahasuerus and sit in his place. Esther. Mordecai. There is a plot against the king. Are you sure? I overheard it. Quick, tell him. Save yourself, Ahasuerus. These men plot against your life. Esther, I shall not forget. Chamberlain, seize the plotters. Your Majesty, they have confessed. Hang them from the nearest tree. What is the name of him who told you, Esther? He is called Mordecai. Mordecai. Chamberlain, let the name be written in my chronicles that it may be remembered. Princess of Persia, I know now which of my nobles are loyal. But in order that this thing may not again occur, I have decided to promote one among you before all other princes, to sit at my right hand and be scrupulous in my interests. Is the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, in our presence? I am your majesty. Then come before me, Haman. Haman, I bow before the king of Persia. Rise, Haman. Know then, my princes, this is he, Haman, who is now second to me. It is my command that all my subjects render him homage and bow unto him. And let those who do not beware of my anger. Make way at the king's gate for Prince Haman. That one there, he does not bow. You there, bow down. 
I said, bow down. There is only one to whom I bow down. Careful, sir, you trifle with your life. My life is in the hands of God. Haman, eh? this man is a Jew. So? A Jew, eh? Shall I seize him? Seize him? Seize one man? No. Ah, you say he is a Jew. Aye. Haman is not to be offended. This becomes a difficult question. Come with me, crier. Come to the palace. We shall cast the poor. Yes, we shall cast lots, and the gods of Persia will render decision. Now, Haman? No. Cast again. The day is not propitious. Seven. It is a favorable number. Again. We must confirm it. Seven. Confirmation, Haman. Still once more. Cast the dice. We must be sure. Seven. A third time, Haman. Now I am sure. Wait for me. I go to King Ahasuerus. <laughs> have need of your counsel. The news is all bad. The battles go against us. I know the reason, King Ahasuerus. Then it is even plain to you. It is, Your Majesty. My course is clear, then. The disloyal generals will be hanged. No, Your Majesty. The generals are disloyal. You just said so, Haman. And no, Your Majesty. The fault is not with the generals. No? They are loyal, Ahasuerus. But there are some in our midst who are not. Speak up, Haman. Who are the traitors? More than traitors, Ahasuerus. They offend the very gods of Persia. They keep diverse laws unto themselves. A strange, mysterious god. Sire. The Jews. The Jews? The Jews, Your Majesty. The gods punish us in battle because of the Jews. Mm. I hadn't thought of it. Think of it now, sire. It sounds plausible, yes. Hmm. If it please your majesty... Go on, go Let on. it be written that the Jews be destroyed. Wait, 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 wait. These things are not to be lightly done. Have you further reasons? One reason, sire. One? An empty treasury, your majesty. If the Jews are destroyed... I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into your hand. You are grown suddenly rich, Haman. Not yet, Your Majesty. But dead Jews have no need for silver. And there are many Jews in Persia. Yes. I like the scheme, Haman. Thank you, Your Majesty. I believe in justice. Ah. But you're not above a bit of profit, eh, Haman? When it does not interfere with justice, Your Majesty, why not? <laughs> now, when Mordecai knew all that was done, he rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. And Esther was told of it and was exceedingly grieved. And she was told also that it was the charge of Mordecai that she should go in unto the king and make request before him for her people. You cannot do it, Queen Esther. But I must. Consider, madam, whosoever comes unto the king who is not summoned to come may be put to death by law. Unless, sir... Yes, madam. You have not forgotten the law. Unless the king holds out the golden scepter. Madam, the risk is too great. I shall say so to Mordecai. The risk is too great. Why do you tell me this? Esther is also a Jew. If the Jews are slain, do you think even she will be spared? She is the queen. Queen or not, the law commands that all Jews are to be slain. But her identity is hidden. I charge her now to make it known. You condemn her to death or the Jews to life. Who knows? Who can read what is inscrutable? Perhaps it was ordained that she be made a queen in the land of the heathen for such a time as this. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mordecai spoke truly. I must do as he charged. Madam, you cannot. You must not. I must and I can. Give my answer to Mordecai. Let all the Jews of Shushan fast and pray for me. And I shall also fast. If I perish, I perish. But whether or not the king holds out the golden scepter, I go to the king for my people. And it came to pass that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne among his princes, and they jested and spoke loudly. And then Ahasuerus saw Esther. Husband, my husband. Amen. I am always glad to see my queen. Thank you, Ahasuerus. Why do you come, Esther? Your Majesty. Yes? I have a request. And what is your request? If it seems good unto a Ahasuerus, let him come with Prince Haman to a banquet that I have prepared. It will be done, Esther. I shall come with Haman. Then Haman went forth that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and he stood not up nor moved for him... The joy of Haman was turned to bile, and he spoke bitterly to Zeresh, his wife. Yes, yes, Esther the queen will let none but the king and me come to a banquet, but now this is nothing to you me. You should be overjoyed. I cannot be. But Haman, why? The sight of this Jew, Mordecai, sitting in the king's gate. Does it upset you so much? It fills my stomach with burn. Oh, you're such a foolish man. There is always a way. Eh? What way? It is still many days before the Jews are to be destroyed by the royal commandment. But if this Jew upsets you, you can uh, attend to him. Eh? But how? What? If I were second to the king, I would not ask how or what. Fill the gallows. Of course. I'm a fool. Fill the gallows fifty cubits high. And in the morning... Yes, my wife. Why, you will speak to the king. But on that night, the king of Hazuerus could not sleep. And because there was something within him that withheld rest from him, he commanded his chamberlain to bring the royal chronicles. And they were read unto the king. Because of this loyal subject, Mordecai, the plot was made known to Queen Esther, and the plotters were seized and dealt with. Chamberlain, the name, the name of this subject. Mordecai, Your Majesty. What honor and dignity was done to him because of this? Nothing, Your Majesty. Am I then an ungenerous man? Does the king of Persia not know how to reward an act of loyalty? Uh, Chamberlain, which of my counselors is in the outward court? The Prince Haman, sire. He wishes to speak with you on a matter of much urgency. This morning I am also urgent. Summon the Prince Haman. At once, sire. Your Majesty. My Lord Haman, you come in good time. Haman, what shall be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Your Majesty is very generous. Not generous enough, Haman. Speak up, my lord. What shall be done to such a man? I am overcome by modesty, Your Majesty. Hmm? Speak, Haman. Speak up. Very well, sire. For the man whom the king delighteth to honor... Yes, yes. Let royal apparel be brought... Good. ...and the king's horse... Good. ...and let the horse and the apparel be delivered to the man whom the king delighteth to honor... ...by one of the king's most noble princes. Excellent. Haman, you are the man. Oh, your majesty. Of course. What did you think? You are my noblest prince. 
You will take the royal garments yes. and the royal horse. Thank you. You, and cause him to ride on horseback throughout the city, uttering my proclamation before him. Uh, him? Him? Did your majesty say him? What are you talking about? Mordecai, of course. The Jew, Mordecai. Mordecai? Haman, your plan is an excellent one. Carry it out. Haman, don't throw another thing. I would tear him to small pieces with my own hands. Haman, that is my best base. Put it down. He triumphed. The Jew triumphed over Haman. Put it down. No. Oh, my best base. Oh, shut up. I won't shut up. I'll make you, you shrew. I'll make you shut up. Shh. I'll see who it is. Haman, you are late. Queen Esther's banquet. Have you forgotten? <laughs> To your good health, Queen Esther. Tree Cayman. Uh, gladly, Your Majesty. Now, Esther, what is your request? It shall be granted, even if it is half the kingdom. If I have found favor in thy sight, I have really... Favor? You are unto me like the spring rain that cometh to the dry plains. Speak, Esther. I ask my life, sire. What nonsense is this? Ahasuerus, I ask my life. And the lives of my people. Your people? Who are your people? The people of Mordecai, Ahasuerus. The people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Haman, did you know this? Uh, Your Majesty, I didn't know. I, uh, there must be some... Be still, sir. Esther... What is your petition? We are sold, Hazuir. I and my people sold for 10,000 talents of silver. Sold for bondmen and bondwomen. Sold for destruction. To be slain and to perish. Does our adversary think that the loss to the king of Persia's loyal subjects would be compensated by 10,000 talents of silver? Who is this adversary, Esther? Show him to me. There he sits. With your wine on his lips. Haman? Haman. Chamberlain! Chamberlain, seize this man! Stand there, Haman. Don't move. Esther, what shall be done with him? Whatever you command, Esther. I, Haswell? Yes, Esther. For you are set as a seal upon my heart. Say what shall be done with Haman. It is not for me to say. I am aggrieved, and I should not speak. Ask of your Chamberlain. Chamberlain, what say you? Behold, King Ahasuerus, there in the marketplace is builded a gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman has made for Mordecai. For the man who saved my life? For him, sire. Let the gallows now be for Haman. Haman, the wheel has turned full course. As you have builded, so shall you live and die. Chamberlain, take him away. So they hanged Haman high on the gallows that had been prepared for Mordecai. And the house of Haman was given unto Esther... And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And Mordecai went forth from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white and with a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan shouted and was glad. And the Jews had gladness and joy and a good day. And they made a festival to celebrate the casting of the lots and called it Purim. And great was Mordecai among the multitude, seeking the good of the people and speaking peace to all his seed. <laughs> A 
copies of the script you have just heard, as well as the talk which follows immediately, may be obtained free of cost by writing to the Jewish Theological Seminary, 3080 Broadway, New York, 27, New York. And now, we take pleasure in introducing Dr. Israel Goldstein, rabbi of the congregation B'nai Jeshurun of New York City and president of the Zionist Organization of America. Dr. Goldstein. We are on the threshold of a new year. It is one of the great attributes of human nature that the approach of a new year induces new resolves and new hopes. After all, New Year's Day is a purely arbitrary point in a physical cycle, yet this physical point can stir in man's inner being processes of self-introspection, repentance, new hopes, new resolves, a new start at the good life, so that a new cycle can begin in his inner spiritual universe matching the new point of the physical universe outside. This is the miracle of human nature and its divine quality. Judaism has been the first religion to fix upon this law of the inward spiritual cycle matching the outward physical cycle. Hence Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, has been informed with the content of the fundamental spiritual law that man is the master of his inner life, that if he has erred, he can repent and start anew, that he can lift himself above the trials and discouragements of the hour to envision new and brighter horizons. Thus man, mere man, can share in the miracle of creation can create a new spiritual universe within himself, just as God creates nature's universe anew every year, nay, every day, with the ever-repeated cycle of day and night, of birth and death. How desperately mankind needs this sense of renovation and regeneration and recreation just now as we stand on the threshold of the new year 1945. In considerable degree, the chances of regenerating the world of human affairs, which is so much in need of regeneration, will depend upon our will to do it and our faith that it can be done. The door to will is prayer. Therefore, on the eve of the new year, we pray. All of us, Jews and Christians alike, pray for a new world in the new year, a world in which the hosts of evil shall at last be crushed, in which peace instead of war shall become the norm of human life, in which the foundation shall be laid for a world order of collective security, and in which the humblest of men and the smallest of nations shall have freedom, the freedom to work at a living wage, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, freedom to express oneself individually and collectively in all the forms of human expression, in a word, the freedom to live with dignity for the Jewish people as a people. It also means the freedom to rebuild its ancient homeland, Palestine, as its national homeland again. In that all-inclusive sense, may the new year be a happier one than the old year has been and lead mankind a long step forward on the road of self-renewal. Thank you, Dr. Goldstein. You have just heard Chapter 13 of The Eternal Light. The script was written by Morton Wishengrab and featured Joan Alexander as Esther and Alexandra Scorby as narrator. The music was composed by Harry Brandt and conducted by Milton Cadens. Cantor David Putterman and the choir sang the liturgical music and Dr. Israel Goldstein was the speaker. The entire production was under the direction of Ira Avery. This program has been a public service of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. It was prepared under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. For free copies of the script and the talk, write to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, 
3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company.